as a technical architect without any uh, delays. Over to you, Len. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Rami. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending the session today. Um, today's session is more about the things that's about the power to make cloud floors that you don't usually learn in the training or at school. <clears throat> Normally, when we start uh, getting on board with the pop platform, we start apps in a day and everything's really smooth and happy day scenarios. And you only hit all these obstacles when you actually start working in the real life uh, project and real life work. And sometimes uh, you, it's if you're lucky enough, you learn it from your peers, you learn it from the colleagues, but if sometimes you learn it a hard way, trying to figure out, navigate around, find a solution in the online community, uh, blogs and the forums. So today I will talk about all these things that I have come across uh, of my experience with the power to make cloud flow over the last couple of years. So as Rami mentioned for, for those who don't know me, uh, before that, um, this is probably the only um, the QR codes, the URL, if you want to have access to the um, slideshow straight away, because some of the slideshows have the, some URLs to the Microsoft Docs that I'm referring to in this uh, session. And uh, my name is Lin, I'm Microsoft Business Application MVP. Uh, I'm currently working as a technical architect at the Datacom. And as you know, like based in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. Um, currently, my main focus is on Dynamics 365 um, and Power Automate for in a, mostly for cloud floors and for automation process and and the Power Apps uh, more driven and, and a, a bit of a Canvas Apps. So for a community contribution, I do a blogging for a participation and a speaking in a conference like this. And if you can follow me on my Twitter and my blog post is just my full name, uh, linsonwen.blogspot.com. And when I'm not doing any work or any community contribution, I my hobby is uh, playing games uh, and uh, watching animes. Okay, um, my first tip for today for those who are using like building part automate Cloudflow is to enable the new expression editor. So that's like my really great advice. Like if you are just starting to use start the part automate and you don't know what's the new expression editor, this is on the left side, what you see is the, the current, uh, the, the, the old or the normal expression editor. And on the right hand side, uh, what you can see is the, the new exper uh, expression editor where you can cascade all these groups. So you it's a, li a lot less to scroll around. And you can also see the this icon of the data type. So based on the data type, you can know it's a okay string value, or is it a array, or is it the integer or float number value. So this is a really good experiment, um, new expression editor. But since it's still an experimental feature, there are still a little bit bugs here and there. But in my opinion, uh, it's what to switch it to the experiment. Uh, this expression editor. Whenever I start working on a new project, new client, when I get in my new account, that's the first thing I do. Go and switch enable uh, the expression editor. So not only in, in the dynamic content, uh, in, in the expression writing, so when you use it in the the normal one, it's like really squish one liner. You can't really see a lot and you have to type. And when you search, like when you go back to select one of the dynamic contents, you switch this tab and then you have you cannot search, you have to scroll through, which is really painful experience with the new experimental feature. You can have a, a big box and then you can even do the indent and see the your expression more clearly. And dynamic value, you can do those cascade and expand groups, as well as you can also search those values. So it's a lot easier 
to write the expression with the new one. And other than that, there's a format data by examples. So Microsoft has recently introduced the new feature that you can format data by the examples where you can format the date time. For example, is this is uh, the date time that's coming in in the data, and then you don't know how to write the expression to get this kind of outputs. Sorry. And then you can just add an example, and the Microsoft used this AI to suggest an expression for what you need. So currently, it supports the, the formatting of the dates, the numbers, and, and the text. For example, you have this uh, full name, and you want just want the first name, and dear Mr. Lin, and then you can do add this format data by examples. So if you want to enable this new expression editor, uh, you need to go to the make.com and uh, click on the settings and view all power automate setting and this and enable it. And then it will refresh and you will see this one. So just to make sure that it is not on the make.powerapps.com, because if you open up the flow, uh, the Power Automate Cloud Flow um, from the Make Maker portal directly. Uh, you it will open up in the Make .com and you won't see that option. So make sure you when you open up the Cloud Flow, uh, you click on this Edit in the New Tab or Details in the New Tab so that it will open up in the uh, the Make .power Automate .com. So. Another reason why I usually like to edit or de open the details in a new tab is because if we currently open it in the make.parse.com, if, if I just click on it, like just open it and it will just show the, the details page, the flow details, which still opens on make.parse.com. And then if I want to open like one of those flow run history or click on the edit, it will go into that whatever page I want. But if I click back on this page, what happens is it goes all the way back to the this list page instead of the flow DD page. So that's why I would always like uh, recommend to open up in the edits in the new tab so that it will open up in the make the right, automate.com. So another thing is the copy and paste the flow actions. So some of some of the times you have an ex experience that you cannot copy it, especially in the switch conditions. And when you uh, copy the flow steps from the one case to another case, it will throw this kind of like unknown errors. So since it's still in the previous state, we can't play Microsoft anything about it. But since it is the preview since um, April 2019, so I think uh, we just ha get, have to like get around with the walk around solutions to um, make 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 it work. So what what, what I noticed this is let's say if I want to copy these five of these steps, um, I can copy it out of the switch block, but not into another branch within the switch. And instead of uh, copying all these switches into the one by one, what you can do is we can just create one scope and put all track, track all these things and just make a copy and paste it outside this block. And once it is uh, uh, pasted outside, you can just drag it back and in, in, into this branch. And then now you get uh, the same copy how you want to copy. So th these are the uh, little bit um, hacks and things that you need to get around and, and make sure when you copy and paste uh, like all these flow steps from across different flows. Or if you do uh, like the there's a undo button now. 
uh, that you have in the borrow to make, like make sure you always, always save it before you do all these things. Like, well, what you have is like sometimes if you are lucky enough, you will see like screen like this or all of these uh, connectors actions with the connections. They will, they will be show these tri triangle icons and you have to um, reselect those uh, existing connections. And if you're sometimes is if, if you are unlucky enough, the whole screen goes blank and you can't save it because there's a copy step has some error. And at the same time, you can also undo it because the whole screen is blank, so you can resolve it. And what you have done over the last few minutes or over, over the last 10, 15 minutes until you, your last save, the, the progress will be gone. So that's why um, whenever you do copy paste and the steps from the different flow, especially with the, those flows with actions with the connection, or when you do the undo, make sure you always save the flow. Um, so the next tip is more for those who are new uh, to the Cloudflow area. So just to name name the flow properly, like name properly as in name name of the flow, name the trigger, all these uh, actions. Don't just leave like list rows, list rows to add a row to. Um, and what I need to do, important to name the flow properly because uh, in a classic workflow, classic process, uh, we, we know that we have what, what is the primary entity that is triggering for this particular cloud flow, uh, sorry, particular classic workflow. But in the modern flow, the flow, we don't know which table it is triggering for, what is triggering for a contact, what is triggering for a case. So uh, this is not a recommendation, it's more of uh, something uh, that I do and uh, what is, uh, you, I usually put a prefix of the, what is the table that is triggering, it, or if it's a manual, if there's a schedule flow, and, and then there's uh, some short description of what the flow do. So I can easily find, let's say if I have a problem with the case, uh, on trigger, on change of the case status, uh, is having some error, I can quickly go and find and check what all, all these flows starting with case. So that's, uh, but it's all up to your you and the, your team to figure out what is the best approach and agree upon. <clears throat> to have the naming convention and follow it. And um, when you also rename the flow uh, and the flow actions, uh, try not to, uh, I mean, change, update all the steps uh, totally. Let's say uh, retrieve existing contact. Mm -hmm and set and like find the fault team. So if we change the name totally, uh, at a glance, we don't usually like know what is this? This is a, is it a list rules action or is it a get, get a get a row action? So I, what I usually do is I usually keep the, the first watch or the, the, the action uh, first course, just to make sure that I know what is this action is. So for example, this is the list context. So this is the list rules action. So, and this is the list rule and edit team updates. So make sure all these diverse actions or even for other connectors, just leave, leave a, a few words from the beginning just to identify what kind of actions this is without actually expanding the flow. So you can have a, a glance, a high level overview of what this is doing without really looking into it in each and every step in detail. So, so even for this, uh, 
action um, the compose also to generate uh, the variable setting the variables and compose action <coughs> we can name something a little bit more meaningful and put the put the variable name within the step name so that we know what variable we are setting in this particular flow. OK, uh, so when we retrieve the data from the Dataverse, I always recommend to <coughs> always filter the use the filter. So this is getting the uh, this is a trigger filter. Uh, when we trigger on account on change, if we don't put any um, select columns or the filter rows, it will trigger on change of each and every change. Um, so my suggestion is always at, at least at the select columns, so you you know which columns are going to trigger this flow. And make sure there's no space in between. Sometimes we type as in English, we after a comma we put a space, and then now your flow is not triggering, and you don't have an error message, and you are wondering, oh, why is not my flow not triggering? So usually there's a space in between, then it will stop triggering. And even if it is possible, you can even filter further by adding the filter rules. So I want to trigger this account when the status is changed to verify. So you can set this to this verify um, the option set value. Um, but the only thing is it can only filter based on the values in the record itself. You can filter it based on or only trigger it when the parent account has such specific values. We, we cannot filter based on the related role. So whenever I use the uh, build the cloud flows, I always uh, use a lot of tools. So I recommend. I still don't remember each and every uh, filter condition and query. Whenever I want to write something, I usually build something in the fetch XML, build a tool, and I click on the view, borrow its own parameters, and I, I get the query and I just copy it. So that's easy way to first start learning. And along the way, you will know like simple um, filter conditions like equal EQ, not equal NE. So you, you along uh, over the time, you just starting to get um, learning more and more about without using the tool. But at first, I, I really just recommend to use the tool. Even until now, I don't really uh, remember on top of my head for those kind of uh, last X months uh, or no after this kind of um, the dataverse specific filter queries. And one of the things that I, uh, for the new people who are really struggle, is the lookup column, which we have to put uh, underscore field name and underscore value. That's uh, so it, it, if you use the tool, you can uh, fight those kind of issues without having uh, a lot of difficulties. And, and another tool that I, I use is the leveled up tool. This is not directly related to the power automate cloud flows, but if I look at the form and I want to query, uh, I, I need this administrator ID, I need a name. And I can just click on the logical names to show uh, to show those the logical name of those fields. And even if the field form field is not on the form, I can put a God mode and show us those forms. And another thing is to show option set values. So if I have this just now, we have the status code uh, verify. We don't know the value. We usually have to go to the solution and get things. So if so show options set value, if you click on it, you can see all these option sets and integer values without going through the solution. And also, I also use a lot 
this uh, open recording web API. If one of the particular field that you update, you want to retrieve in the uh, records is not on the form, I can click on the open recording web API and it will just open up in the JSON and you can see this record data. So same thing uh, in the, when you select the records, instead of just putting the select, it will present all the columns. So let, let's see if we're retrieving from teams and it retrieves all, all of the columns for this team. So it's not only impact the performance, that's also in your design time, you have a lot of scrolling to go through the final, find the values that you're looking for. So instead of that, if we know, okay, I'm only get a team ID name and this reader, you put it those there and you can only see a very clean list in the dynamic values that you can select with uh, a few other uh, default, default options. And one of the things that I saw people struggling a lot with this is getting a array from object from the array. So let's say that's the default for default team is only coming one record. Okay, I want to set this team into the owner. And if people a lot of time they just put they just click on this team from dynamic and boom, it just automatically add into the apply to each loop. So because even though there's only one record coming, it is coming as an array of one records. So we need to first put it in the first and call it, uh, select the value of this array and then put this to, uh, at the attributes at the end. So that is how you get the object of arrays from the, uh, the first object from this particular array. And another thing is some people, they ask me, oh, why do I use the fetch XML? Or is it easier to put those uh, select and filter queries? Which one is easier, which one is better? Um, it's, for, for me, I always use to try to use the web API as much as I can. For a, this particular scenario, we're going to get the account starting with A, and it's all is related to contact and the full name. And this is also this equivalent version of the uh, web API version. Uh, we don't have to know about how to write each and every expand query and everything. For me, I personally, I just generated from the fetch XML tool. And what happened is if we use the fetch XML, I am, are you able to see the screen well? <laughs> okay, so what happens is, let's say, it, it's this particular name, like the, the account name is repeating in all, all of these uh, array values. And in, uh, and also there's a, for, for each contact, it, the, the, the parent account is repeating. But if in the web API, there is it's a cleaner format where there's account information up there, and there is a array of the child records, contact records, so it is easier to loop through and uh, use this to uh, access this data. Uh, but in, in some exceptions where there are, you cannot achieve some of the queries with the web API, like you're, you want to filter it based on the parent, uh, parent's record. And, and in those kind of scenarios, uh, I also have to use the fetch XML. But uh, in most of the case, I try to use the a web API version as much as possible. Um, another thing is getting the formatted value. Um, it's when we want to have this uh, choice, this option sets names, labels, and the lookup names. Without going to retrieve another query, we can just get it by using the adding this add all data community 
display dot v1 a formatted value. So you need to know a little bit about uh, writing an expression. You cannot it, that value cannot be selected from the dynamic values. So once you do it, instead of uh, true and false, it's coming as allow even for boolean like status instead of one, it comes as like active, and so this a uh, lot easier. Okay. Um, Well, when you build low rules, uh, my recommendation, especially for an enterprise projects, I'll always use the application user service principle when you uh, authenticate the Dataverse connector. Uh, you cannot do it from the, when you, it's a bit tricky how you, uh, for a first time, if you don't know how to do it, um, I, you cannot just create a connection from the connection reference space. Uh, so you have to go to the one of the flows in the flow designer. If you click on a new connection reference, and it will open up this dialog, and then you have to select connect with service principles. So at that point of time, that's the only way uh, you can create it. Uh, you can have if you download the slides. There's a the blog post by Matthew, which is a step by step how to create the application user in the Azure Active Directory and how to um, add the service principle. So you, you can just follow this blog post. I'm not going through in detail in this um, presentation, but what I'm going to do uh, tell you is to get this tenant ID easily. Uh, you can get it from Azure, but if you don't, for some reason, if you don't have the access to the Azure, uh, you can get the tenant ID in the make.rs.com. Uh, you can click on the settings and session details. There's uh, the tenant ID, uh, GUID will be there. Um, the use of the uh, the service principle, it's good, but there's a, it comes with another challenge because ideally uh, you just want to have one connection reference authenticated with a service principle and it's a share across multiple makers or multiple developers. But what's happening at the moment is I can go to the solution, I can see all the connection references, but when I actually open up in the flow designer, I can only select the ones that I own, or at least I authenticate for this connection. So for example, I'm, uh, we have the developer A and the developer B. So developer B A has created this connection reference with the service principle he he built a cloud floors okay everything happened and developer b come in he, he cannot see that in the connection reference list so like he has to create another one on his own so which is not really ideal in some of the scenarios so uh in my one of uh, my Previous projects, what they do, they have this share service account, this Active Directory login user that you can log in. They call it the uh, process user. And then they use that user every time they want to create a new flow. They log in as that, that user, create a dummy one, one step. And, and once you create a step, uh, the flow, another user who can Go and edit, they can see the one connection reference used in the flow. So editing, there's a real problem in the editing. The only problem is creating the one. So, but the share service account is probably not ideal for all organization because some organization, they don't allow a share service account because it's uh, not um, auditable. You don't know like, who log in and access. They always enforce the name user account. And in that case, um, one recommendation is someone takes the role of creating those dummy flows. And you just 
create a one flow with Dataverse um, connector. And then you just you can just leave it outside of the solution. So whoever so so developer B who want to build up build another flow, they can just pick up edits and then they can edit into the solution. So what if that's like that person leaves the organization? What's the that main person leaves the organization uh, or he leaves the project and then um, you, that's all right. That connection reference will still be there. What you need to do is the one who is like succeeding that role, he just need to create a service principle and under his like in his browser session. And once you edit this connection with a service principle for this new um, new person. And then the new person can be can see this connection in the in the flow um, this flow editor page. So this is not related to the owner. I just try to show it just to visualize. This is not directly related to the owner. This is more related to the who is the user who created the connection or this connection reference. And then it will that person will have visibility to the this connection reference. So that's one of the things. <clears throat> OK, so the next slides are a little bit of um, kind of a licensing related kind of thing. So anything, please don't quote me on it. Uh, any, Confusion, uh, please reach out to the your licensing experts. And so I'm just going through whichever I found it's the docs and based on my experience. <laughs> and and you know the Cloudflow owner is important because this owner is the Cloudflow on in the Cloudflow is the owner who is getting charged for these all these actions. So all these automated the schedule flows always run in the context of the flow owner. So what happened is, <clears throat> so that's why it's important to set the service principle as a staff flow owner, because if the someone leaves the organization, that person license, like dynamics license, everything will be removed and those flows will stop running. So just like how you assign the classic workflows to the application user, also assign the cloud flows to the application user. But currently we don't have an uh, option to assign it in the flow studio. So currently Microsoft documentation says uh, assign it through the web API, but what you can do is you can assign it to the Advanced fine, classic advanced fine. But now that the Wave 2 has released how you can access classic advanced fine, you can still go to the advanced settings. You can click on the advanced fine there, and then you find all this process where the category equals to the modern flow <laughs> and find those and assign those flows uh, to the application user. So this is for more for when you, you need to think about when you are building the cloud flows for a really uh, big projects where you are it's running a lot of uh, a lot of uh, requests. So why why we need to use the service principle for the uh, cloud flow is uh, currently with the licensed user. For a request limits, it's for a, this is for a Dynamics 365 user, is forty thousand. So let's say I'm like the admin. I'm the only like see I'm admin at organization.com, and then if I use my connection reference with my name, all of the cloud flows will able to run it for forty thousands. But if it is for application user. 
there were a number of requests, probably like 500,000. But this is across the whole tenant level and all, all of the non-licensed user. So no matter if you have application user, 10 user, or application one user, the, the, this is number will be pool. It is shared across all the applications and non-interactive users. So um, this is that's, that's the reason why uh, you need to use the application users for those non-interactive and automated processes. And this is for a uh, automate. Uh, you can get the now that's the preview, the power power platform request capacity uh, report. You can download it from the uh, power platform admin center. You can go through this URL to find out how you can download it there. And if you need more capacity for a project, you can always uh, buy the capacity add-on. So that is the limit that you can buy purchase more but there are some limits that you can't so which are service protection API limits so it is the 6,000 requests within the five minutes sliding window so in in the cloud flow each, each and every step is count as one request even compose initialize variable even if condition are just one API request so make sure you Cater and build uh, for that. So if there's a something like really heavy loading cloud flow, you might want to consider splitting in the different connection reference with the different service principle, different application users, so that it will not reach this limit. Because if you use one application users for like 200 flows, which are running like dozens of like hundreds of times within five minutes, you can potentially reach the, this limit. And this is the service protection limit for the whole Dataverse one. And there's the one for the whole cloud flows only. And these are the actions per 24 hours. So that's one thing that you need to watch out for. So it's a 10,000 for low and 100 for medium, 500 for high. So you might be wondering for this low, medium, high. So low is pretty much like free and a very, very basic license. And medium is more of a premium licenses. And so if you have those flows that are really running a lot of actions within a day, you might want to have to consider using the automate per flow plan to achieve this 500,000 requests. So this is a bit of a, a opposite direction from Microsoft, what Microsoft is doing. Like there is a local platform where we build a lot of things in the local. For example, like this, like current time, we convert it to the New Zealand time at seven days. And we I just want the date version of it and I do a compose. So imagine this is five steps, five ABI call, and I can just achieve with the expression in one API call. So it's all about the, the expertise of your team. If your team has a bit of more pro dev kind of uh, technical consultants, I recommend doing a bit of playing around with the expressions or we're using a lot of actions especially assigning the variables and all these things. Um, so both of these actions will have the same result. OK, um, that's the end of the session. So if you have any question, uh, just please unmute yourself. If you're online or if you're here, you just um, ask me. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the naming conventions you were using for your um, your flows, is that something you'd usually have as a project team set up initially? And so everyone's renaming things the same way, or does it tend to be a, a rogue maverick thing that you'll name things one way and someone else does another thing? How, how do you handle that? So we normally have uh, agree, have a discussion in, in the initial beginning of the project as a team uh, among the, all these devs and the consultants who are going to build the flows. And then we 
have a agreed uh, agreed naming convention, and then we put it in the wiki. Yeah, like normally a DevOps wiki, and then whenever you use on board for the new person, just go through this one. Yeah. Be some sort of penalty as well if someone doesn't do it. They feel it's all right. Um, one of the ones that I've been kind of struggling with is I've built quite a few power apps and they've got a lot of patch functions in the app, which then takes the app forever to run. It's hard to move them over to power automated and just let that do the heavy lifting. Um, but is there much value in there where you can do single small patches to turn them all to add flows to go there? So if I can build it, everyone might like, start hitting those limits or is it one where you've said heavy lifting across to power automate? Um, in, in terms of that, uh, if, if it is uh, something that is, it can be run uh, like asynchronously behind the scene, it's better to have like patch one flag or one value and let the asynchronous flow trigger on change of that field and process the data. And but if, if it is something that needs to return it um, the back to the app, yeah, I think there's no choice. Like we have to, yeah. Um, we've got a question online, um, just asking about the tools that you mentioned. So fetch XML was one of them. Yes. The other one was uh, level up, level up browser extension. Um, you can find it on the. Chrome store or Edge uh, extension store. You know who created them? Uh, Natraj. Natraj. Yeah. Australian. Yeah, he's Australian. He's yeah. the one who nominated me for MVP. Always me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Microsoft doesn't like level up. That's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you go out on the records, so <laughs> it basically bypasses all of them. <laughs> Um, the, the, the front end, and we had some interesting conversations about um, level up that you know with the product group saying, "Oh, it should be removed and all of that." And we're like, "No, if you have like you know bad designs that can be bypassed, that's not our problem. So they just need to make sure that the applications are robust. Because if if Natraj didn't build it, there'll be an alternative somewhere else or a blog post that tells you how you can do it and what JavaScript you can inject into it. So um, it's all about best practices." Um, just uh, looking at the chat, I think there's one one question in here. Sometimes Microsoft converts expressions to dynamic content on save. It was not possible to copy the expression from that item. Is there any way around this? Mm, expression to the dynamic content on save. Um, so I believe it becomes after expression is saved, it becomes like a block. Uh, in that case, I I, I think in, in the new, uh, if you click on the that block, it just usually show what is the expression is. Or even if we want to copy the whole thing, we can just put a cursor in, in that uh, box. And I usually press Control A and Control C select on copy and put paste it in the notepads. Just work around. Yeah. All right, any more questions? All good. All right, well, thank you very much then for your awesome presentation.